Okay, so let's just dive right in. The first topic is software engineering. So the first thing is like what programming language should we use? Um, and it seems like a basic question because the answer is clearly Python today. And, but maybe we should think about why the answer is Python. And it's not necessarily because Python is a great language for scientific computing in itself, but the libraries that people have developed over time for it are really the answer. It's because of the libraries. So NumPy, uh, Pandas, now TensorFlow, PyTorch, like this is the reason to use Python. There's actually things about Python that aren't good for scientific computing, um, such as it's not typed. So we can't say that something has to be an integer or a float or a float 16. But there's things that have been added onto the language that I'll talk about that might help that. Um, code editors, so, you know, Vim, Emacs, that's the standard kind of tools of the trade, but not in data science, right? In data science, people don't usually go to Vim and Emacs, they usually open up a Jupyter notebook. And I think that's an interesting thing to just remember because your tooling really does influence how you do things. And uh, the Jupyter editor has been getting a lot better, but it's still not, you know, at feature parity with a real code editor. And so there's certain things that you can't easily do in a Jupyter notebook. Like you can't rename all of uh, a function name and all the places that the function is used very easily. You can't very easily break things up into files or um, trace through things. So Visual Studio Code, I think, has recently emerged as uh, an editor where people feel familiar with it. It's not too daunting. It provides a lot of value. And then kind of going towards the end of that spectrum, uh, PyCharm is what people use if they want like a full-blown integrated development environment for Python. So Visual Studio Code, I think, is, would be my recommendation. If you currently use Jupyter Notebook, I would highly recommend looking at Visual Studio Code and trying to do more in that. Uh, it's a very nice Python experience. Like specifically for Python, it's a nice experience. Uh, there's built-in you know, version control staging and diffing. You can look at documentation, so as you start typing, you get like a little documentation window that helps you uh, actually call the function correctly. One cool thing is that you can open remote, so on remote machines, you can open a whole project uh, on your local Visual Studio Code environment. So this is very nice because your laptop might not have any GPUs, but your you know, work machine does. And in the past, it's been a challenge for me to like you know, you work local and you are sync all the files over and so on. It gets very painful. So Visual Studio Code makes it like super painless. And then, you know, you can lint code as you write, which I think is important. So I want to talk more about that. So once again, if you're a solo data scientist, you're working in a notebook, you're hardly given any thought to uh, code style, right? Or potential mistakes that you might be making uh, just that can be revealed through static analysis. But as you start working with the team, as you start kind of codifying your best practices, if you have any code style rules that you, you think everyone should follow, they should be codified. So any code style rule that can be made a rule should be made a rule and then basically automatically checked for and ideally even automatically formatted. Um, static analysis can catch some sorts of bugs. Like if you have syntax errors, that can be easily caught. But also if you call a function that expects three arguments, but you call it with two arguments. In Python, you wouldn't catch that until you actually tried running it. But if you have a static analysis just running in your code editor, you'll catch it as soon as you write that. So it really does save a lot of time. And this is another thing that notebook environments don't have. Um, and then static type checking is an interesting new addition to Python. So Python 3.5, I believe, introduced type hints. And that I think, yeah, that can be seen in this, um, the little peak window that says train model. So a model is supposed to be a model with a capital M. That's a Keras model. A data set is supposed to be a data set. Uh, epochs is supposed to be an integer. Batch size is supposed to be an integer and so on. Uh, GPU, end, uh, GPU end has to be an integer, but it's also optional. So it doesn't have to be provided. So that serves to both document your code, but also through using of um, a static type checker as a linter, 
you will actually catch mistakes. So if you, if you call train model with batch size of like 12.1, that'll be caught as you write that code, not when you actually execute it, because it's not an integer. Um, so that's super useful. This lab actually has this built in, and we'll, we'll cover that in uh, lab seven tomorrow. So Jupyter Notebooks, I don't want to sound dismissive of them. I mean, they're really fundamental to data science, and they've been, I think, transformative of the field. Um, and I think it's a great use of them is to use them as a first draft of a project. So when you're first just hacking away on a new thing, uh, you want to look at data, you want to like quickly try some, try, try some things, and you don't give too much thought about uh, reproducibility, or you might even actually just rewrite all the code you're, you're writing now later. So that's perfect. And I would recommend Jeremy Howard from Fast AI uh, just watching those like Fast AI videos. He has a lot of tricks like folding up cells, you know, moving with Vim shortcuts through the cells. And I think watching him, you kind of quickly get good at it. But the problem with them is that it's difficult to make them scalable. Uh, it's difficult to reproduce results that were originally obtained in a notebook. And it's super difficult to test the stuff that you write in a notebook. So a counterpoint to that that I want to give you know, some credit to is that Netflix uh, reportedly based like, their entire ML infrastructure on notebooks. So everything has to run as a notebook. Uh, and the complexity of the diagram, you know, I think, speaks to the feeling that I have about it, which is that it's not worth it. Uh, <laughs> but I want to give them a shout out. So the problems with notebooks, I just kind of want to get a little more deeply into. And uh, like I have my five reasons, but then actually it's the same reasons that uh, Alexander Muller uh, wrote in this, in this blog post that I linked to. So I wanted to give him credit as well. So notebooks are hard to version, um, partly because they mix output with input. So the code you write and the code that gets, or you know, the results that get generated. The version control treats them as the same thing. There's ways around it that basically only check in your code, but not the results. But sometimes the result is actually what you want to check in. It's like, I think a perfectly good reason to use notebooks is as an additional form of documentation. So it's like, you have your code, maybe you have a readme file about it, but then you also have an execution of your code with results like images or whatever it is uh, stored in line. I think it's perfectly good to actually check that whole you know, document with the results in the version control so that I can just open it and quickly see it. And then, you, and then it's hard to version because then every time you uh, re-render it, basically everything changes, all the images change. The, uh, the editor that the notebook uses is very primitive. We talked about that. Very hard to test, so you have to basically build your own testing you know, harness for notebooks. And I think it's much better to just plug into decades of software development experience and just use the tools that other people built, like PyTest and, and um, unit test and so on. You can get artifacts through out of order execution. So if I write a cell and I run it, and then I write another cell and I run that, but then I go back and I run the first cell, then maybe when I run that second cell, the results will actually be different, or maybe not. But there's no way to, to prove it. And so people say, well, just execute the whole notebook every single time you change anything. Uh, OK, that'll get rid of the out of order execution artifacts. But it also destroys part of the reason for why notebooks are nice, which is that you can just add a cell and run only that cell. And then it's hard to run distributed tasks or just long running tasks. So you know, I think it's better to just log into a machine, launch a console command, you know, log out a day later, log back in, see all the results, you know, where you expect them. In a notebook, it just, it's kind of a separate ecosystem for doing that stuff. I want to give a shout out to uh, an app that just recently got released uh, just a couple of months ago. So it's called Streamlit, and it's, uh, it's pretty great at fulfilling a need that comes up very often in data science workflows, which is, you know, I got something working, and I want to share it with the rest of my team, or I just even want to have it for my own use. Uh, and basically, something that I can play around with, like maybe there's a slider I can slide around, or different images I can load in and run my model on. So how do I package that up and share it with other people? 
So this is kind of the traditional workflow is you have a notebook, you've got some cool stuff, you put it in a Python script, and then if you run it, okay, it gives you the figure, but now if you want to share it, now you have to write a web server around it. So you use Flask, and then you need some JavaScript for the slider and so on, and pretty, you know, pretty soon you're in the unmaintainability trap, right? Where you were doing data science, but now all of a sudden you have a web app that you have to maintain, and it's just very painful. Um, and so the Streamlit workflow solves that by basically giving you like nice primitives um, just as function decorators. So if I have like a function that renders a plot, I can simply decorate it, but I need a, a slider to control one of the parameters. I can like decorate it with one line of code uh, using the Streamlit library and then get a cool little applet to play around with. And then the reason it's, uh, it took them like you know years to develop it is because they actually do very smart caching and re-rendering stuff uh, in the back end. So for example, if I load some data set and I render that in a, in a figure, and then I change just a little bit of my code but not anything about the data, it won't actually do anything about the data because that'll be cached internally. Um, and so just the part that I change will re-render, so it'll be very quick. But on the other hand, if I change something about the data, then it'll figure out that it has to rerun the whole thing. So it's nice. And then, yeah, the, the dream here is that I want to be able to like basically have this applet and then just somehow get a, a URL to it and then share it, you know, send it to my boss, right? That they can log in and play around with the model I trained. So that's not currently feasible, but it's in the works. I want to pause for questions. All right. Um, are there any VS Code extensions that you recommend for machine learning? There's the Python extension, which I don't think comes in by default. So if it does not, then just search um, Python, and that's a good one. I think there's one for notebooks. It's, and maybe Chris will talk more about it uh, later. But I haven't personally used it, so I can't recommend it. But there's a way to load up notebooks in VS Code, which could be interesting. Um, those are the two that come to mind. Similar question. Um, do you have any recommended code styles or like NumPy styles? Yeah, the one that's, so Lab 7 is called Continuous Integration and like, I think that's what it's called, but part of it is also linting. So I actually provide like a script and a set of rules that I think are best. Have you seen the Databricks notebook? And if so, how does that compare to Streamlit? I have not seen it. So I cannot answer. Um, and then, uh, so for a lot of giant models, like for AlphaStar, for example, you might need to you know, constantly do fine tuning, um, training on new data, curriculum training, and this might involve freezing parts of the model and training other parts of the model. Are there any good tools for making that process easier? I think the answer is no, and I think that's an opportunity for someone to build a tool that makes it easy. What do you think, Josh? I completely agree with that, yeah. yeah. Like, I think most um, research labs build tools like that in-house, um, or you know, just individual researchers build their own tools at a, on a project level. But I think um, to the extent that you believe more and more people are going to be doing that, then it could be really valuable to create a tool that helps people do it more easily. I think that's right. So the first 